it's time for the visit with the person of high strangeness. Uh, I guess in the opening chart, uh, you probably recognized a couple of people. One is uh, Jim Mars that you met before on a previous show. And of course, I was hanging out. And the other gentleman you see there is Ingo Swan. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, so let me jump back in time and start at the beginning here. Uh, earlier in the year 2002, um, I had the opportunity to go to a um, remote viewing conference. Uh, one of the viewers uh, had donated a plane ticket to me so I could go to Austin, Texas and um, do interviews with a lot of the remote viewers um, there and there were so many of them there at that time. And uh, so like I said, so at the last minute the uh, ticket came in and someone donated the hotel room and it's because of the help that I had from the friends was I able to go to Austin and uh, on from there and later on I went to Native Americans which is another story. So while I was on the plane, uh, you know, as it, it, things go sometimes and you have a layover and I did in Denver and people kept saying, well, where are you going and what are you doing? And we had a whole congregation of smokers, uh, some of us still smoke. And so we were just chatting um, and talking about our destinations. And so I was telling, I was telling, I don't think so, I don't need an audio with that. Um, so, so anyway, so I was telling the people where I was going to Austin that I was going to a remote viewing conference. And so they had me explain what it was. But as it turned out, it was easier just for me to say, I'm going to a spy conference. And people said, oh, OK, that's cool. And so that's how we worked around it. And so eventually, like I said, I did get to, uh, to Austin. And there were all these wonderful people there. And in my opinion, some of them were the most brilliant minds in the universe. And so what I want to do is introduce you to um, some of them and hopefully to all of the speakers that were present at that conference. Um, there was a lady there. She was supposed to have given a talk, and her name is uh, Gabrielle Pettingale. And uh, it, it soon was apparent that she wasn't there, and that's because she had a car accident just a couple of days before. So the people present there gave a, um, they did a memorial service for her. And little did I know that there were actually um, clippings and uh, talks available with her on it. So with permission, um, what we did is we put some pieces together. And um, in the year 2001, she gave the talk in Las Vegas on martial art uh, f for the mind. And so after a while, we're going to share that with you. And the friends was nice enough to give me permission to use that footage so instead of uh, me just having a little interview, which was not possible. Um, I'm going to share a talk, uh, her whole talk with you. And that's somewhat different than what you used to, because usually we have live guests. And um, uh, by live, I mean they are in the studio, or we have inserts. And so I thought for a change, you might enjoy just listening to a lecture. Because what she really talks about is what we're going to set up for the next uh, maybe two or three shows, and that is what CRV, that stands for Controlled Remote Viewing. Uh, she'll explain to you what that means, and there's also other angles of um, this, this whole, it's not a phenomenon, it's because it is a, a learned behavior. And so she's going to explain to you how it came about, and I thought it was wonderful that um, this this interview was available. Um, on the Art Bell Show, remote viewing has been very popular here lately. And one of the viewers is Ed Dames. Uh, I'd like to let you know that Ed Dames was not there. So if that's who you're looking for, he is not with this particular group um, that I went to. The other thing that was real uh, wonderful that there is a gentleman, his name is Ingo Swan, 
and he's actually the person that puts most of the programs into place and trained most of the uh, remote viewers. And that was, from what I understand, the last talk that he was going to give. And then he will get back to his paintings and things now. All the speakers that you see behind me um, on your screen there, they have um, uh, all, 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 those, all those speakers, um, can, can we, I'm sorry, <laughs> we had a little distraction in the studio here. All these people um, that you see behind me were present at the conference and like I said, we will have individual interviews with them at a later time. Now Ingo is a wonderful artist and everyone of the speakers that you see there, if you go to my webpage, which is Sigeria.com, www of course, you will see that there are homepage links to each and every one of these people. So we ended up spending five wonderful days together. It got a little crazy occasionally and of course you have recognized um, uh, Jim Mars and he was there and his girlfriend, then we were selling books and things. Uh, some of the books that they had are not now out of print. They were written by Ingo Starr. So if anybody needs contacts how to obtain some of those, uh, maybe you could give me a call. And just to give you a general idea, um, what we are looking at for the next few weeks, they are full interviews with Dr. Graf, um, two crop circles uh, researchers. We have. Um, uh, John Kovac, uh, a remote viewer, and uh, Lynn Buchanan. Uh, the conference was at the uh, at the DoubleTree in 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 Austin, which was a very nice place. And at the end of the conference, we had a BK party uh, in which we learned how to bend spoon, and I had spoons and I had shared that with you when we had the, uh, the Libertarian Party and we showed you how we can actually do that and to remind you the name of the show is Martial Arts for Your Mind and this is somewhat different than what I do as a psychic. I go into, uh, I use my third eye and I go into uh, uh, the ether and, uh, and I follow my guidance and I pull up sometimes what they make reference to as video in the head because I'm looking, I'm physically looking at things. It's also a different method uh, when we look for missing persons. Remote viewing consists of a very disciplined uh, protocol that has to be followed. So uh, people that take these um, classes and learn this, they almost have to make a decision that's what they want to do because the, your life as you know it is no longer there. Remote viewing becomes a, a way of life and you just have to put it into uh, in, your, in your daily life on a regular basis because it is, it is somewhat different than what psychic viewers uh, do much as myself. And um, so as time goes on, I'm going to introduce you to all the people that were there. Um, some of them were from Louisiana, they came from Dallas, they came from, uh, we had a crop circle researcher from Japan actually, and he was telling us that the government they had finally financed some of the things that he wanted to do. And um, I don't know how we are for time, <coughs> but there are just so many, so many people there and I was able to put some of these together for you. Um, at the end of the show, I might not have time to say anything to you. And so therefore, if anyone is interested in getting a hold of these people, please go to my webpage or give me a call and um, I can arrange that for you. I would encourage everyone to attend a conference at least once because the energy is altogether different. Uh, when you go to a psychic fair or workshops for other intuitive type things, the atmosphere is just so different. And like I, I said in the beginning, the way I explained it to the people on the plane and at the airport was, is I'm going to a, to a spy conference and when Gabrielle explains what's entailed here, I'm sure you'll 
understand what that means. And so if you ever are in a town and you see a, a conference of that sort, it would really be, you know, I would encourage you to, to just go and see what these people are really capable of doing. And it's a very fascinating uh, subject. And like I said, we're going to stick with this subject for at least three weeks because we have a lot of interviews. Now, for some of the friends in, um, in the Texas area, you had asked me uh, to see if if I could do interviews uh, with a with a young lady, and uh, you know who she is. Um, you're the friends that I'm talking to, and I, I did manage to do that. So give me a call, and um, I think we're going to just go ahead to and introduce you to Gabriel, the late Gabriel um, Pettingale, and enjoy. Um, her, her talk, and my director is going to set up for that. And, uh, and a half or so years with the Stargate is. program. Um, my background was uh, I have an undergraduate degree in psychology. Um, I then went into the military, served in military intelligence. I worked in several unconventional units doing uh, sort of strategic pa planning and analysis. Um, I bumped into the program. Uh, while I was doing that and thought, I want to do this. So when they had a slot open, I, I left the service um, and joined the, the program as a civilian. While at the Stargate program, I was a remote viewer. I also was an operations officer and also was a training officer. So I kind of wore three hats. I remote viewed the whole time I was there. Um, but in between, I also did a lot of training, trained quite a few people, and uh, was uh, also ran a number of operations. Um, after leaving the unit, I got my MBA from Morton, uh, worked as a management consultant, and uh, also stayed in the reserves the whole time. And so, you know, Paul and Lynn kept saying, come, come join us, come join us in the, in the real world. And I kept hoping, you know, since I had my clearances, maybe the government will do this again. I'll just sit back and wait, uh, like a real dreamer. And uh, so uh, after 10 years, uh, I've, gi I've given up and I've come out of the closet. So this is my first kind of exposure to the RV community in the civilian world, aside from uh, working as a trainer with, with uh, Paul's company. But um, so be gentle with me, OK? <laughs> I, I don't know all the politics, and I don't want to know all the politics. But so anyway, aside from that, what I'm going to do today, Paul, to make sure I totally stepped out of the closet, invited me to please talk to the audience, particularly to the people who don't have a background in remote viewing. And he said, I want you to set the stage. I want you to set the stage and tell people what we mean by remote viewing and give them a little history. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start with the history, and it's going to be fast. And as you know, history and reality is very murky, and lots of things happen at the same time. And history in books is very linear. Okay. Now, to be able to do it fast, I'm going to make it linear. So if I, if, I, if I twist something just a little bit, a date, who did it, or, or that, forgive me. It's so that it, it makes sense to people who are new to it. Then after that, I'm going to tell you like that. Okay. Can everybody hear me in the back row? Okay. Good. Okay. This, by the way, any artwork you see in the background, except for the picture where I have a pic picture of Ingo Swan, that's Ingo. But all this artwork is Paul's. He, um, I don't know how many of you know that, but he is quite an accomplished artist, and he tends to do things kind of like this, and, and it's pretty neat. Uh, again, the topic of here is remote viewing, and um, I like the expression martial art of the mind, because what we're talking about isn't something spontaneous. It's something deliberate. It's something practiced. It's something that if you use discipline and do it repeatedly, you get better. There's also brings in the concept that some people are pick it up very quickly and are very good at it. They become black belts. And other people, it's a bit of a chore. Um, I don't think I ever got past a white belt in karate, and there's a reason for that. Um, and the same, same thing is true with remote viewing. Anybody can learn it, and there's going to be some people who are more talented than, than the others. But the more you practice it, and the more you apply a strict discipline to what you do and do everything precisely, the better you get. And that's, that's me. That's my company. And I wanted to start. Again, this, the one thing we want to make clear is this, this is IRVA, the International Remote Viewing Association. We're not here to talk about other things. We're not here to talk about channeling, mysticism, out-of-body, um, and any other new age 
topic you want to talk about, we're here strictly to talk about remote viewing. It's, it's pretty narrow, but it's just as exciting. And here, just to set the stage, I want to start with a definition of remote viewing. This is from the DIA Remote Viewing Instructors Manual. And uh, it, it says, the acquisition, remote viewing is the acquisition and description by mental means of information blocked from ordinary perception by distance, shielding, or time. And again, that means describing something when you're not physically co-located with it. That's, that's it, okay? And um, remote viewing, in the way we mean it, is something that has structured protocols. It's not just a spontaneous um, action. It's reproducible. It's trainable, and it includes processes for dealing with what we call mental noise. Now, I'm going to be talking in depth later about mental noise, but really what that is is just your imagination or, or your analytic response. In real life, when we see something, like we see a cat peering around a door, we just see part of it, we say, oh, that's a cat. We have a little bit of information. We complete the picture using our analytical self. In remote viewing, we get the information in also a little, and our mind says, oh, and makes conclusions about it. They get a little bit of fur. They might get a, a, a hint of green. They hear something that sounds like a meow. And we say, oh, it's a cat. And that is what contaminates remote viewing. It's just the same thing that we do in real life. But in remote viewing, you don't have enough information. So imagination wreaks havoc. It might actually be a lion. It could be a dog. But with those few little pieces of information, your mind instantly starts to form a picture. And so in controlled remote viewing, you have to have processes which teach the viewer to look for what that happens and deal with it. And that's what makes this different from natural being naturally psychic. This is what makes it trainable and re reproducible. It's the ability to handle mental noise. And I'll talk about that more. But first, I'll start with a history. OK. What's good, we, we go back to 1960s. And in the 1960s, at least it, everywhere in the world, people were starting to get interested in the human potential. You know, physically, we're reaching for the stars. And, and science had reached all these, these you know, new reaches, and, and so human, the human potential was the next frontier, and everybody was interested in it. And in the U.S., that was really more of a pop culture thing, particularly when it dealt with ESP. Um, on a scientific front, it was more, there was such skepticism around that type of thing, that most experiments dealt with proving it, proving that psychic processes exist. Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union, they took it for granted that it existed, simply because of their culture. Okay, so they started already, it exists. What can we do with it? And so they had very intense and rigorous programs to find these natural psychics and put them to use. What are the military applications? What can these people do? So they weren't interested in so much in training or figuring out how to you know, get everybody to do it. They just were saying, we have these people, what can we do with them? And our intelligence services saw that, and they got to get a little concerned because they thought we really weren't doing anything. But that's kind of what's happening in the government. Meanwhile, in, um, in a little town called Menlo Park, there was a, a think tank called Stanford Research Institute, SRI. And there was a laser physicist there, Hal Puttoff, who had finished a laser project and was thinking, you know, I really would like to learn more, uh, find out more about, you know, these extrasensory processes. What can we do with it? What, what is it? I want to do some experiments on that. And if you work for a think tank, anybody who works for any kind of um, consulting firm knows uh, that if you want to do something, you have to find your own money for it. <laughs> they, they don't just give you money. You have to go out and find money. So he went out, and he got an initial grant from Frank Church of, of Church's Fried Chicken to, to look at that. And he, he also started just circulating um, uh, ideas, proposals around. He circulated in the government and with other organizations who were doing psychical research, um, and, and that was happening. Meanwhile, again, remember I told you real world, real world history is not linear. Um, in New York, an artist, um, writer, and naturally psychic person named Ingo Swan um, was realizing a, a little bit about his, his abilities and was offering him up himself up to a couple of different studies as a subject. He worked with City College in New York, and he worked with the American um, Institute for Psychical Research. And he bumped into the proposal. And so he contacted Hal Puthoff, and, and sort of the rest is history. But they went on to do some studies. He and, uh, Hal Puthoff invited Ingo Swan out to SRI, 
And his initial interest was in PK, psychokinesis, creating movement of matter with, with using just mental energy. And so he had this, another scientist had this device that was designed to measure the magnetic field set off by quarks. Now what quarks are, are little tiny itty bitty bitty bits of, of, of an atom, and they're very small. And so you can imagine the magnetic field they set off is very small. And so you can imagine that any other magnetic field anywhere else in the world um, would be larger than that small little itty bitty magnetic field set off by the quark. So this device designed to measure that is buried in concrete. And around the device there are several, several layers of shielding. It's designed so that the only thing that's going to touch it is that quark's little magnetic energy. And then, you know, back up on ground, you know, there's a little meter, you know, a chart that comes out, you know, just like an EKG or something, where it, it measures, okay? Um, and so he came, he got Ingo Swan there, he said, I want you to, to affect that, that meter. I want you to, to, to make it move. And Ingo looked at him and said, right. <laughs> and so he thought, well, how can I go about doing that? And he thought, I don't even know what it looks like or how it works. So he got out a piece of paper and he started to sketch. He started to remote view the device, okay, to get an idea for what is it? What is it that, I, that I'm supposed to make move? Well, how, while he was doing that, the little meter started moving, okay? And everybody said, oh. <laughs> and when he stopped, the meter stopped. And so... Hal Putoff took that little experiment and he attached it to some of his funding requests. And it just happened to go across the desk of somebody in the CIA. And it also just so happened that Hal Putoff happened to have uh, security clearances left from when he had been in the service. So everything came together perfectly. The, the CIA, who was very concerned about what the Russians were doing and wanting us to get involved, all of a sudden had this perfect package. They had. A, a, a scientist, a very legitimate scientist, one who had, uh, had great credentials, who, you know, who wasn't already contaminated a lot by the world of ESP, um, willing to do research with good subjects, and so they gave him money. And that started the, the program fully. So um, it, Hal put off and, and then had Russell Targ join his effort and a number of other people. Um, and uh, the name Scanate wasn't its an initial name, but uh, it was a name I think Ingo Swan came up with for describing the process of rem remote viewing, that you're, you're sending out a scanner, and that's where that name came from. And as I'm, actually, as I'm going through this history, um, most of the people are here. Hal Putoff is going to be here, Russell Targ's here. Uh, later on, you'll see Lynn Buchanan, Mel Riley, Paul Smith is here. All the players are here um, at uh, uh, Skip Out Water, whom you already met, here. Uh, this person's not here, so I included a picture of him. This is Ingo Swan. Uh, it was taken a number of years ago. Uh, he's standing in, one, in front of one of his pieces of artwork. Um, and so, so we had, anyway, so we had SRI doing work, and they did a lot of things. They gave up PK pretty quickly because they saw it was very hard to study, and they weren't getting that far. Then they started to look at other types of psychical processes, and they came across studying remote viewing. Um, and they learned a lot about it over the years. They learned that you can't shield from it. It's not, it has no kind of radiation. They learned that. They learned, uh, they learned that you can just give coordinates and a person can tell you about it. Then they learned that you don't even have to use the real geographic coordinates. You can just make up a number and if you have an idea of where you want the person to go, they'll go there and get information. So they, they learned lots of neat things um, uh, over the years. And Again, like I said, this story has lots of threats. Meanwhile, while the CIA was doing this, the Army uh, had a group in Fort Meade that looked at, it was called Operational Security Organization, OPSEC. That means they're interested in protecting our secrets. And they had this systems exploitation team that went out and tried to pretend they were the enemy spying on, on us and to help units get their act together and, and be better about their own security. So this, this organization was you know, going out and, and getting their satellites to take pictures or they would go and, and, and see if they can talk to people in the unit and get them to tell something about it. They, they would pretend to be like the enemy trying to infiltrate the organization. 
And one of the people there, a, a then Lieutenant Skip Atwater, who came up here briefly, um, I had, had read Mind Reach, the book about the SRI work, and had, um, had some exposure and found some files that, that dealt with the work being done by SRI. So he went to his commanders and said, we should be doing this. The Russians are doing this. We should be seeing if it really does work. And so they decided to, to develop a very inexpensive program to see if they could, quote, psychically spy on, on our own, you know, on our own people. I mean, on our own units. And so they went to SRI and got some protocols and started work. And some of the original people from that unit, Mel Riley's here, a couple other people, um, they started working. And at that time, they, uh, there was still not yet a set method to train remote viewing. And so they would just say, okay, I'm thinking of it. There's a target in this envelope. Tell me what you think about it. And they would try different techniques, like maybe being in a meditative state or, or you know, just writing things down. And, and it worked. They had fairly good results. Um, and that program was called Gondola Wish. Uh, now, as these units were, it quickly became obvious there was a lot of issues with, one, it was working, but two, they were doing it against U.S. peoples, and that's a no-no. Um, you're not supposed to, uh, to do strange things with your own people. So they had a lot of human use issues. And so they started to say, well, you know, maybe we should be Spy, using it to spy on, you know, on the enemy instead, that would solve the problem of involving American citizens in something they not, don't know they're involved in. And they also um, started to develop procedures for having permission uh, to do this type of thing. Uh, meanwhile, you know, so SRI was doing research. You had the Army starting to kind of think of a way to apply it. They weren't that concerned about the research angle. And there was also an Air Force unit who was dabbling in it. So then uh, DIA got involved and started to pull together these pieces. And that program then was renamed Girl Frame. So it was the same program. And they were starting to develop, you know, starting to realize that this actually works. They would give an intelligence question to the unit, and the unit would describe things like, uh, like what does a particular weapon system looks like, looks like, or what's in this, in this building. We've always wondered what's in this building. And everything moved along. Meanwhile, back at SRI, um, Ingo Swan was doing a lot of work thinking on how, how do I do what I do? And how, is it, how can I make it better? How can I deal with mental noise in a structured way? And he started to think about it, and he came up with his own little protocol. And it turned out it was teachable. So then um, uh, DIA passed the program totally back to the Army because they decided it's politically not wise to dabble on these things. So the Army had the program all by themselves, and they sent people, a group of people, Paul Smith was one of them, um, to, uh, to go to, and Ed Dames was one, and Bill Ray was one, and then there was uh, one more person, Charlene, who's not here. They went and were taught by Ingo how to remote view using his new methodology. Um, and it was very, it, it was very successful. These people, uh, some of whom had very little background in anything psychic, were able to actually report and describe things that were not in their physical proximity. And not only that, uh, they saw they improved over time, and it was fairly easy to train it. Um, then the Army, of course, at this time, the Army had been dabbling in a number of things like this. Um, aside from doing the remote viewing, they were also doing a lot of other kind of esoteric things like uh, neuro-linguistic programming and uh, hemi-sync and, and a number of things. And when the new commander of uh, Army Intelligence came in, he was a skeptic and he did not want this in his unit. So fortunately, DIA stepped forward and took, took the unit back. So came part of what was known as Sunstreak at DIA, and that's when I joined the unit. And the unit continued to operate, doing operations for on intelligence problems given to them by various organizations, the CIA, Army, Air Force, DIA. Whoever had a question who had, had kind of bumped into the program would submit their requests, and, and the unit would gain information for them. Um, at the same time, SRI still was working for DRA doing, doing research in these processes. 
um, later again, they, they changed the name again to Stargate. Stargate's kind of the, 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 uh, the known name for all this stuff because that was when the, when the program was terminated and it was announced publicly. It was under the name of Stargate. The name change had just occurred simply because they changed some of the, the security classifications. So whenever you do that, you have to change the name, which they did. Um, when uh, DIA, again, people who have been, were involved in this program usually became believers. But there were always some skeptics around, and there were always people who didn't want it on their turf, whether they believed or not. And there's a reason for that, because the American public, um, really, especially at this time, was not going to be really happy to know that, that money was spent on this kind of thing. And so this program kept continuing to be shuttled around, because while people wanted it, they liked the information they got out of it, it was still somewhat of a hot potato. So. Um, in the early 90s, DIA kind of uh, shuttled it back to CIA, who really didn't want it. And the reason they did it at that point was DIA's mission had changed. And um, the whole intelligence community was reorienting because DIA was starting to do things CIA was doing, and CIA was starting to do things DIA was doing. Okay, one's the Defense Intelligence Agency, the other's the Central Intelligence Agency. And so they were saying, we need a clear line. And what the program was doing was very strategic. So they said it should be CIA because it's not really tactical. You know, it's not at a, a, it's more usable by everybody, not just a service. So they wanted to push it back to CIA. CIA didn't really want it that much. So they said, well, we're going to com commission a study uh, to see if what this unit has been doing for the last uh, 10, 15 years is, is really been worth it and if there's some validity to it. Well, um, so they got a small consulting firm, uh, the American Institute of Research, to look at it. But there was a problem. A lot of the projects the unit worked on, um, they couldn't get clearance to let them even look at it. So the, with a very minute, limited set of files, they gave it to this, this consulting organization, which hired both a skeptic and a pro-psychic person to look at the data. And of course, of course, the, the pro-psychic person came up with, yes, it was statistically valid. They did prove that it does work and it's useful. And the person who was not, who was more of a skeptic came and said, no, they did not prove that it was, uh, that it really, you know, was applicable and, and worthy. And since the CIA wanted the latter answer, that's what it went with. So, um, so the program was killed and the, pu the study was published and it was announced to the American public they had done this work, but not to worry, it was not being done anymore. Okay, so that left a void. <laughs> and it left a void and it left something very useful. And so, of course, uh, a number of people very wisely started to set up companies to further explore this and, and to do and, and to build on what the, uh, had originally been started in these units and to make it applicable to, one, to train others to do it. It is a human skill. Everybody should know. And it really, the goal, I think, of everybody who ever works in any of the companies I know is they want to train as many people as they, as they can. They think this is something everybody should know how to do because they can do it. Um, in addition, they also want to find out applications for how do we make this useful to people who aren't spying, <laughs> you know? What are, what are the practical applications for companies, for individuals, for humanitarian organizations? And, and that's kind of where we are now. And, as, and that's what kind of IRA is about, is, is supporting these efforts to get more people remote viewing. So, that, so that's sort of the history. And now I'm gonna do sort of a remote viewing 101. Uh, again, I wanna tell you, the best way to understand what something is is usually to know what it is not. And in this case, it's not video in the head. And, and, and I'm guilty, I know when I talk about, when I remote view something, a person will swear I was there and walking around based on my description, because it sounds like it. And, and it's really not. It's not like you just are taking, like you're in this other site, you know, observing as you would be if you were standing there. You, when you remote view, you get little packets of information maybe four or five concepts like red, blue, green, or, or if it's more uh, higher level concepts, you know, religious or educational, or, and it's, it comes in in bits and pieces, so it's not video in the head. Um, now, as you collect more information, it does start to fit together and the puzzle's completed, so you do get a very 
you can get a lot of information about the site, but it's not as if you were there. It is very hard to remove few things that are man-made constructs like symbols and numbers because it is not video in the head. Um, the other thing it's not, it's not astral projection. Um, you know, both your bodies stay where they're at. Uh, it's also not channeling, and it's also not an out-of-the-body experience, OBE. So um, what it is, again, it's this procedure for gaining information, physical descriptors, okay, we're using a set of structured protocols, and, and again, anybody can do it. It's reproducible, it's trainable, and it's got specific ways of dealing with mental noise. Um, what it, one thing to realize that for remote viewing in this aspect, there's certain criteria that have to be careful to be there for you to consider that this was something done by remote viewing and not, you know, not contaminated by analysis or something. The viewer must be blind. The viewer, because of the effect of the imagination, the viewer can't know what they're working. Okay. It's best if the monitors know, if they're using a monitor or somebody in the room with them who's record, you know, asking them questions or whatever. It's best that the monitor not know either so that they don't lead them on. Um, the cueing or targeting must be non-suggestive. And that's the idea of using like a, just a number to represent the target. Like I say, I want you to describe the Eiffel Tower to me. I'm not going to say describe the Eiffel Tower to me. I mean, how are you going to be able to remote view knowing that? I'll say describe site 46234. And, and you'll tell me, oh, it's, it's metallic, it's big, it's, and you'll start to describe it. But if I tell you to describe the Eiffel Tower, I can't trust that you're not just describing the one that's in your imagination. Um, for remote viewing to work, the viewer has to ultimately get feedback. Um, and that's, that's just the idea of something being trainable. You can't learn something if you don't know how you've done. So feedback is how that's done. At some point, the viewer needs to know, what did I view and was I correct? Similarly, known truth, there must be a known truth or a ground truth. You can remote view anything. You can remote view the contents of a book. You can remote view um, an idea. And so if, if the target doesn't really exist, um, you're, you're trained to give an answer. So you'll go to the, the next thing available. If there is not really, say, um, say I believe that a crop circle, or no, no, that's not good, let's say. Um, say I believe that there is, a, a company is going to, uh, has plans to build a facility in the future, and I ask you to remote view it, and something happened and it wasn't built because the company went bankrupt. Um, there's no telling what, what you'll come back. You're not going to come back and say there's no facility, okay? You'll you'll probably remote view and say, either give the ideas for the initial plan, or you might report there's an empty area or whatever's currently in the area, or you might report that, um, uh, who knows what else, something that's nearby that's of interest to you. you know? So if there's, if there's no answer, there's no telling what you get. So you have to make sure if you use remote viewing that you know what, that the viewer, what the viewer is working on exists. Um, if you want to, book, to be able to truly believe your, your, your results. That's not to say that for fun it's fun to work against something where the ground truth isn't known, but you have to realize there's no way to know whether or not you're actually viewing the site or somebody's ideas about the site or even you know, a novel about the site. There's no way to tell if they're actually going to that physical locality because there's no mechanism for that in the remote viewing protocol. Okay. Similarly, when you get remote viewing, you get little bits and pieces of information. You don't get it all. It's not the video in the head. So if you're trying to answer a question, it's best if you have what we call other ints. That's other forms of intelligence. If you're trying to find a person, you can't just rely on remote viewing. You have to have an idea where was that person might be, what might have happened. To, to be able to look at the results you get, the results are not going to be complete. They're going to be bits and pieces, just parts of a puzzle. If you don't have any other pieces of the puzzle, the remote viewing is not going to be that useful to you. So you really, it works best if it's paired with other forms of information. Um, and I'll show you an operational example of that later. Okay. Now, the most important component of, of remote viewing, and, and the, we 
as we talk about it, the formal structured remote viewing, is that having a way to deal with mental, mental noise. Again, natural psychics can be very good. It's usually they're very good or they're very, and then they're very bad. And the reason is mental noise. Their imaginations kick in. And there's several types of mental noise. The first is analytical overlay. And some of you may know these as stray cats. It's what your mind does to finish the picture. You have bits and pieces of information, and your mind says, aha, it's this, aha, it's that. And again, with, like with my example with the cat, you, you, you don't have enough information to truly make those conclusions, but your mind has been trained to make conclusions. And so um, th that process of making conclusions based on limited information is called analytical overlay. And that's one of the things that we find we can train viewers to recognize and deal with. Another type of uh, mental noise is environmental overlay. Say I'm working in a room on a project, and there's a woodpecker out in the yard, and I hear a tap, 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 and a report, well, there's a tap, tap, tap at the site. OK, so that's, that's the environment kind of encroaching in on your process. And you have to be careful to realize, did I hear that for real, or did I hear it you know, in my mind? In clemencies, if uh, the viewer has worries, if the viewer is physically distracted, that will affect, can affect your sight if you're not aware of it. Um, if you're very, if you've had a very bad day, you're sad, you're, you're just droopy, and you've been asked to remote view a carnival, you will probably, if you don't realize that you're doing this and haven't been trained to deal with it, you'll probably report on a very horrific place. You know, one that is, is, is depressing and gaudy, and, and, and it's all based on your own emotionals emotional response. These are called inclemencies. So you have, one of the things that we train is to teach you to deal with these things and not them allow them to affect your viewing. Um, these, these, this type of mental noise. And the last type of mental noise is when you have more than one viewer working on something. Sometimes if there is such a great import, a t importance attached to it, or if it's something that's very hard to view, sometimes the viewers will view what each other is viewing, as opposed to doing their own independent um, of work, okay? And that's called telepathic overlay. Or in the case, again, if it's something where the target is not exactly what it's supposed to be, um, the viewer will go to the next strongest psychic signal. And they might go to the, to the person who's tasked it intent, the monitor's intent. If the, if the monitor believes that something's at the site and it's not really there, and the monitor really wants to believe it's there, sometimes the viewer won't go to the site. They'll go to what the monitor wants just to please them. That's called telepathic overlay. Um, types of remote viewing. There's many different ways to do this. And uh, one type's called outbound or beacon. That's where uh, a person actually goes to a site, and then the remote viewer reports where that person is and what they're doing. Okay, and, and the idea sometimes of that is that there might be an increased, you know, psychic energy attached with a person doing that, or, or uh, it's, it's just one, one way of doing it. That's called outbound or beacon. Another is called extended remote viewing, and that's the idea of, of putting yourself in a very meditative state, lying down, and then describing, say, getting coordinates, and then just describing what you see. That's called extended remote viewing. Associative remote viewing is, is a technique that's using remote viewing to answer questions. Like, say you want to know whether stock A is going to go up tomorrow or down. That's something we'd all like to know, I bet. Um, well, you can't remote view that, OK? It's numbers, first of all, and it's concepts. And, and really, what's, the, what's up and down when you think about it? You know, up and down for, you know, for the head of the company is a little bit different than what up and down means to you and me. So it's very hard to remote view. So instead, you don't ask the remote viewer to, to view that. You don't even tell them that's what you're interested in. What you say is that I'm going to hand you a picture tomorrow night after the stock market closes. I want you to remote view that. And uh, you have two different pictures, one for if it goes up and one for if it goes down. And that's called associative remote viewing. The remote viewer is not actually remote viewing the question in hand. They're remote viewing something stand that's designed to stand for the question. That's an associative remote viewing. Last, we have what I teach, which is controlled remote viewing. This is a step-by-step -step process where you're not in a uh, trance or anything, where you're sitting up using pen and paper to systematically describe a site. And the process kind of goes like this. We have 
um, when, when you're remote viewing, the information comes in in bits and pieces, and it comes in, at first you get a little, and then you get more. So you, you start, you have sort of a general feel for the site. Oh, it, it seems like there's land, or, there's, or it's mainly water, it's mainly structure. That's the major gestalt. That's kind of your first impression of the site. Then little bits of information will start to trickle in, and we, we train it in this order so that so that the viewer can control mental noise. By doing this step-by-step -step process, and by starting with the very simple and then building up to the complex, the viewer can control their imaginations better and keep track of that process. So then we start with very simple sensory data. We do tastes and smells, colors, textures, and sounds. So that the viewer might say, if it's the Eiffel Tower, um, first they'll say the stru it's a structure. It's a structure. And oh, it, there's, there's green and brown, and, and I see white, and it's metallic, and it's, 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 it's crusty, and it's, I hear people sounds, I hear traffic, uh, and it smells, ooh, it smells like gas, you know, it smells like exhaust. Um, and so they get this type of information, and then we have them move on to dimensional concepts. So they've had this initial, initial sort of sensory exposure to the site. And what we found with those sen that sensory data is the imagination tends to leave it alone. It's used to having that type of information in the brain and, and, and just letting it be. But then you start to get dimensional information, and you say, oh, it's high, it's, it's, it's wide, it's, it's got holes. And, and so you start to describe the Eiffel Tower dimensionally. And that's where the imagination really starts to kick in, and that's where we start to train the viewer to be, realize that's when they're going to say, oh, it's a bridge, or oh, it's a girder, or oh, it's a bungee jumping tower. Um, and we, the viewer is taught to uh, how to separate their response from the true data. Um, next, we move into more complex data, and that's qualitative and intangible data. And then something like the idea of it being a monument or a tourist attraction, or that it was, that it's old, um, and some of its history will start to come through, and that's where more in-depth de in information comes in. Now, when, when they're remote viewing, a lot of times a viewer will say something very complicated, and you think, where did that come from? Uh, and so then there's a procedure called stage five, where you kind of go offline, you're no longer accessing the target, and you look at what you've already had and try to figure out, well, what made me say something? Um, if I said uh, the word uh, museum, and you think, well, what made me say museum? And then you, in stage five, you'd break it out and say, well, I saw exhibit, I saw exhibit case, and I saw, um, you know, a couple things that relate to a museum. That's called stage five, and it's, it's breaking down the information you've already gotten into what caused that information to be said. Lastly, um, you can do what's called stage six, and that's looking at the site in detail. It's either in th a three-dimensional mode, describing in great detail the physicality of the site, like making a clay model, or doing a floor plan, a room by room. It's where you start to really put together all the information you're getting and have enough contact that you really can say, this is in front, this is in back, this is to the left, this is to the right, on a three-dimensional way. But it also is a point in time where you have enough site contact where you can move in time and say, okay, what happened at this site a year ago? or, or uh, or in the future, or a hundred years ago, where you can move in time. This is called stage six, and it's, it's when you have enough site contact that you can do sort of a four-dimensional assessment of the site and get more detailed information. So those are the, the, state, the six steps we teach. Um, obviously, you don't have, have to remove you that way, but it's a way that we've found, if you follow the protocols, that have you go in this order, from very simple physical information to complex ideas, you can better control your mental noise and, and, not, and, and keep working without trying to guess what the site is. Anyway, here's a quote um, by Dwayne Elgin. He was one of the SRI subjects, and I, I just love this. It says, once you discover that space doesn't matter, or that time can be traveled through at will so that time doesn't matter, and that matter can be moved by consciousness so that matter doesn't matter, well, you can't go home again. And for me, that's the biggest reason to study remote viewing. I, 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 it was certainly a major change in my way of viewing life since I started remote viewing, the before and after. I'm still the same old mundane boarding person I was, and that hasn't changed. But 
there's this kind of just spark saying, yes, you know, I, I can do this. This is neat. I can trans, I can move in time. It's, it's, I guess it's, it's the way I capture this moment is, is the first time I give usually a student something like the lunar lander. It's their first time off, quote, off planet. And they finish that session and they find out what, what the target was. And they might have described seeing this blue ball up in the sky or something like that. That it's that reaction to, I did this, that you can't go home again. And it's a very powerful thing. That's, that, that's one of the reasons. Um, the next reason gets into the whole martial arts of the mind. It's a I, I sort of really hope that you enjoyed her lecture. And uh, we don't do lectures very often, but I thought it was well appropriate. And so I really hope that you have enjoyed that. And um, like I said, for the next two weeks, we're going to next take reason forward. gets into the whole martial arts of well, I guess she had to say something else, I guess. Uh, we're going to go, uh, next two weeks, we're going to go ahead and, and show you the interviews, interviews with some of the people. And I really appreciate it for having laid the groundwork for um, what these other people is trying to um, explain to you. And I hope that, like I said, I hope that you enjoyed this. And I don't know how we are for time. Um, I have no major announcements to make other than uh, the summer wasn't really all as great as we expected, but we still have another month to go, so just hang in there. And like I said, if you run into a conference on the internet, um, it would be really nice for you to go and see and hear what these people have to offer. And um, I have a total blank. And actually, let's talk about that. That sometimes um, happens when, when we're in that frame of mind. Uh, we just have a total blank. And because, like she said, once you've looked at something and examined it, and then your mind learns how to just close it off and put it away, because you, there is no need for you to associate anything other with that subject, at, unless what you already stated. And um, I'd actually put that to the test one time. I followed one of those targets with the four numbers, and. Um, uh, it had all the components and all the places and everything there, except I didn't know it war what it was. And, and then the problem came in when I was trying to outthink what I had been looking at. And not in a million years could I have guessed that what I thought was a, a polar bear, actually was a panda bear, would have been Christopher Reeves. And so that's how it goes sometimes. And, um, If you call me, we have uh, some upcoming classes with some of the speakers. And um, I would think that at least every, every year there is a conference, sometimes even in your area. And uh, there's a lot of books available, Ingo Swan, um, Skip Atwater, Dr. Graf, uh, Crop Circle books. Um, let's see, what did I leave out? Um, Lynn Buchanan teaches, like I mentioned, and uh, what you're looking at now is some of the activities and some of the friends that uh, came. They were not all speakers. Some of them were just ordinary people that wanted to learn some of the things that Gabrielle has shared with you today here. And um, so we hope that you had a nice visit. The gentleman there, he's a crop circle researcher from Japan. And um, uh, Gabrielle, we wish you a safe journey. And I hope I see everybody next week when we will continue our, um, our visit into the mind and um, tell you more about what Gabrielle referred to as the martial arts of the mind. And this was the conference in Austin, Texas for the year 2002. And come see us again uh, next week. Well, I guess I'm not done. Uh, 
Hemisync, that's part of the Monvo Institute, they were also present. I hear music, I gotta go. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>